Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being on the call, even though it's kind of slower holiday week. So I appreciate you putting the effort in. Thank you. Uh, so first question I have for you is this. Uh, I did run across, and people are always looking for money managers, so I ran across a money manager. And this is a money manager that's run by two Nobel Prize winning economists and has a 100-year back testing. They've never lost uh, money a single year for 100 years. So run by two Nobel Prize economists. And it's got a 100-year back testing. It's never lost money for a single year. So how many of you would like to know the name of that um, money manager? Oh, we're getting quite a few that would like that. Because, I mean, if you think about it, how valuable would a money manager like that be? I mean, how much of our clients' money would we want in a money manager like that? What, what return? Well, here's the return. So as compared to the S&P 500 here, or the Dow Jones Industrials, look at what it did. So how's that? I mean, it blew everybody away. This is a long-term capital management. It did this in 1998. It was run by Merton and Scholes. So they are two Nobel Prize winning economists. They back-tested their model for uh, 100 years, didn't lose money a single year. The minimum. The minimum size to put money into this was $100 million. The minimum size <laughs> was $100 million to put money into this account. And it worked great. Looking from 1994 to 1998 for four years, bam, 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 killing it, killing it, killing it. And then look at what happened. So it worked. 100 years back testing, how did that help you? Two know about prize of economists, how did that help you? So when somebody says they have a money manager who's got it figured out, why do you think I say they're full of crap? If two Nobel Prize winning economists with a 100-year back test and can't do it, guess what I know? With, with $100 million as a minimum client size, guess what I know about your money manager? They ain't as good as these guys. They didn't have 100-year back testing. They didn't have a $100 million minimum. So here's the thing. How many outcomes are there available for us in the market? How many variables are there in the marketplace? How many variables? Yeah, I would say almost infinite. That's right, Walter. I agree with you, Walter. Infinite. There's an infinite number of variables. We do not know what's going to cause the market collapse until it what? Collapses. So why do I bring that up? Well, what's our job with clients? It's to give them the, the, the <laughs> lifestyle, the rich and famous. What's our job? What's our job with our clients? If a client comes to you and they have not, um, if the, a client comes to us and they have not saved enough money for retirement, should we say, hey, we can help you with that, take them on as a client and grow them out of that problem? What kind of client is that going to be? A client that it does not have enough money to retire, but you say, hey, I'm going to grow you out of your problem for retirement. What kind of client is that going to be? How long? Right, Bruce, a problem. How long before they sue you? Not long. So our job is to keep them ahead of inflation. They retired, and they want to maintain their lifestyle, don't they? So we can't bury them under a, under a big rock in the backyard. We need to maintain their lifestyle. But lifestyle is about 3% a year. So you look at... Uh, uh, milk has gone from 226 to 358 from 1983 to 2012. That's a, an annual re inflation rate of 1.5 percent. So you see all 1.5 all the way down here. You know, you get health care and tuition; those are t big ones. Uh, health insurance 7.4 percent, tuition 7.3 percent. Uh, but look at uh, uh, international phone call down 10 percent a year. Uh, uh, airfare actually has has stayed um, the, the same basically. So the average inflation is 3%. So we, our job is to what? Give them, try to get them the lifestyle of the rich and famous or make them more than 3% a year? And I want everybody to answer this one. It's our job to make them be a life for the uh, lifestyle of the rich and famous or to keep them ahead of inflation? I got one person answering. I want you all to answer this. Keep them ahead of inflation. That's it. Good. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. See, we cannot, can we make them happy? Our jobs as advisors, can we make them happy? If we get them a, a 
twenty percent rate of return. Can we? Will that make our clients happy? That's right, Brad. I won't. Will it? Because Brad, if I get them, if I get them a twenty percent rate of return, Brad, what do they want? Yeah, that's right, Bert. They want twenty-two. That's right, Steve. Twenty-two more exactly. So we can't make them happy. I don't care what you do. Let's say, let's say, even if they're happy with the twenty percent, if they're happy with the twenty percent, but their their um, son is becomes ill, or um, uh, or or their uh, the team, the football team they love loses the Super Bowl. Something as silly as that. The the, the team they love loses the Super Bowl. Will the twenty percent make them happy? Son gets ill. Favorite team loses the Super Bowl. Will the twenty percent make them happy? No, it will not. But we can make them unhappy. How can we make them unhappy? Yeah, that's right, Bill. How can we make them unhappy when we lose twenty percent? So we have the worst jobs in the world. We can never make our clients happy. We're never going to be good enough for them, are they? Are we? But boy, the minute we take a misstep, we make them unhappy. So we need to avoid that. So does that mean I don't like securities? No, because securities go up. 70% of the time, 70% of the time, securities are going to go up. So guess what? We need to be in securities. But we also need to be in what? Guaranteed. And bonds, sure in the heck, ain't the place to be for guaranteed. FIAs will be, is the place to go for, for uh, guarantees. Because if the market does well, will FIAs beat the pants off of bonds? And if the market does poorly, is it going to be guaranteed? There's many reasons to do FIAs. So this is why we want 50-50. Not because I don't like securities. Look at what I'm saying. Hey, go ahead and put half the money in securities. But again, anybody who says they've got it figured out on the security side is cruising for a what? Cruising from, for what with their clients? Cruising for a bruising. Because the only thing we should promise our clients on the equity side is what? If the market goes up, their accounts will what? If the market goes up, their accounts will go up. And if the account goes down, their accounts will what? Go down. And more often than not, your accounts will what? Go up. That's all we should be promising them. We shouldn't say we're going to make more than the market. We shouldn't say we're going to lose less than the market. Because if we really believe we're going to make, our managers really believe we're going to make more than the market or lose less than the market, here's what I would tell them. They can have my millions and millions of dollars, okay? I'm going to give my I'm going to give that person all my money to manage. All I ask is one for one thing. For those of you who know me, what is the what is the uh, what am I going to ask for from your money manager? Those of you that know me, if they're making promises. If they're, they're, that's right, Dale, their house. So all I ask is that if they are if they're not right, if they're really convinced that they're going to beat the market or they're going to lose less than the market, I'll give them all my money to manage. All I ask is for the mortgage to their house and their 401k. If it does not, then what will happen to all their promises? What will happen to all their promises? It goes away. So as soon as you tell me you have a money manager that's willing to do that, I'm going to make that deal with you. Is that okay? Is that a fair, fair thing? Unless we go 50-50. Because 50-50, I know on the 50-50 <laughs> model, stocks are going to go up and going to go down. And I'm not making any other promises than that. Make sense? Because here's the thing, Daniel Kahneman, father of behavioral finance, basically found out that people prefer avoiding losses to making gains. Now, if all I get now, if all I do is say, hey, would you like to make a gain, what do they say? If I ask somebody, hey, would you like to make a gain, what does everybody say? Yeah, 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 I do, I do, I do, yeah, 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 yeah. But I would say, would you rather make a gain, but there, if, if there's a 50-50 chance you make it a gain, a 50-50 chance of you making a loss, what happens to everybody at that point? They want to be in the game or they want to be on the sideline? That's right, Bert, on the sideline. So further down it says, note whether a transaction is framed as a loss or a gain is very important to this calculation. So here's the exact same offer, okay? They, they, they offered people the exact same offer. They offered them, would you rather get a 5% discount or avoid a $5 surcharge? So it's the same $5. And guess what creamed? Guess what uh, the other one? What did everybody want? The 5%, $5 discount? or to avoid a $5 surcharge?
Guys, think about this. They, are they worried about uh, gains or are they worried about avoiding losses? So you guys, we got some people who get it, but we got lots of people who don't get it. Guys, if they're, if they're more afraid of losing than they are making a gain, a discount is what? Making a gain. A surcharge is what? A loss. So which one are they more likely to, to uh, it killed? They want to avoid that surcharge. See, but as advisors, what are we constantly promoting? Hey, I can get your higher rate of return. Get your higher rate of return. Get your higher rate of return. Don't be an idiot. Sure, if that's the only thing we're offering, then yeah, they want that. But you got to help them understand. If, if hey, if we can, if you can look them in the eye, and you're going to put your house and your mortgage and your 401k and your retirement plan on the line, that if you if what you're saying is a big fat lie, that all you can get them is gains. So then go ahead and do it. But what happened to Bernie Madoff, who made that promise? He's in jail. Because nobody can make that promise. Nobody can. So it said the study found price increases had twice the effect on customer switching compared to price decreases. Giving them a better deal, as we've, as Jeff uh, and I have, have, have harped and harped and harped on, what will people do for a better deal? What will people do for a better deal? See how many right answers you get here. What will people do for a better deal? What will people do for a better deal? Yes, dudes. Okay, the first four answers were incorrect, but now we're getting some right answers. Guys, do you remember Jeff talking to you about you're in a theater, you're halfway through the movie, the movie's okay, it's it's fine. It's okay. It's you know, it's it, you're it's not the best movie in the world, it's not the worst movie in the world. And the, and the manager comes in and says, folks, 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 your attention, please. There's a much better movie next door. There's a much better, it, it blows this movie away. I mean, the, the, it is funnier, and it has more action. You gotta go over to that other theater. How many people are gonna move over to that other theater? Man, he's promising them more funny, more action. He, he, he promised them all sorts of things. And this movie is just middling that I'm in right now. People don't like change. Now, here's a real easy way for the, the manager to get them out of their seat. Comes in and says, hey, I uh, just want to let you guys know we think that we found some bed bugs in these seats. Now what's going to happen? How quickly will everybody get out of those seats? So the thing is, <laughs> people are not going to move for a discount. But they are going to get angry if they're charged an extra dollar they shouldn't have been charged. Do you get that? People will do anything to avoid risk. Hey, so can when I we're presenting, what do we present? Second? Yeah, please, Jeff. I'll tell you what they'll do. If you, I'll tell you what people are willing to do for a gain. They're willing to think about it. <laughs> and so if that's all you're showing them, then that's what they're going to tell you. We'll think about it. And then we'll let you know. And then you guys know how that turns out. So anytime you've presented something and they say, I need to think about it, Jeff, what do you sus without them without even listening to the tape, what are you suspecting? I suspect that you said, Hey, I've got a better movie for you. <laughs> and they said, uh, let's think about it. Because then what they have to do is go home and put it on a scale and say, uh, is it really better than what I'm doing right now? And and if you saw the Dan Aureli TED talk that Mike shows at the training, one of the things he said was, you know, we think this. We think the issue is easy, uh, but they think it's complex. They think it's, um, man, it's it's hard. You know, I've I've been doing this for a while, but this looks better. Um, mine's turned out pretty good, but there was that rocky thing in the past. But this one, he's promising no rocky thing in the past. But can anyone really promise that? And and even if it's better, is it that? What happens when they when they can't decide because it's too complex and there's too many uncertainties or too many moving parts? We always do what? We default to what? The status quo. Yeah, and and unfortunately for us, that's the other guy keeps the money. 
But now so, I'm gonna, and Jeff, maybe you can help me with this. But here's the unfortunate thing that happens to advisors. And for those of you that go back to your college psychology classes, do you remember what the, when they talk about random reward, about the dangers of, <laughs> or the, the, well, I guess the dangers, the dangers of random reward. See, if they rewarded the rat every time he pressed the button, then the rats would know every time they press the button they get a piece of food. But what really screwed up the rats is when they went and pressed the button and sometimes they got food and sometimes they didn't. When they did that, how often did the guys, how often did the rats go press the button? See, if they knew that every time they pressed the button they got food, they only went over there when they get, wanted food. But when sometimes when they pressed the button they got food and sometimes when they, they pressed the button they didn't get food, how often did they press that button? Well, Jim got it right. See, random rewards causes people to go do it over and 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 over. That's that's how gambling works. That's how Vegas works. Do do you know when you're going to win with Vegas with, at at the table in Vegas? No. So it's ra winning randomly is what keeps you what coming back. So what do you think the point I'm making here, based on what Jeff was saying? What do you think the point I'm making here? Jeff's saying, hey, you know what? When they say when we show them the benefits. They say, I need to think about it. But why am I bringing up this whole experiment with rats and random rewards? Because sometimes, often enough, when you show them the benefits, what do they do, Jeff? Yeah, they might do it. And that's probably and the worst thing that could happen. Advisors. <laughs> that it works. We just need to do that more or do it better. <laughs> and does it? No, it's just like Vegas. It's You can't put a quarter in the slot machine, pull it down, and get a jackpot and think, well, I just have to do that more, do it better. You're not going to win. <laughs> but it makes us want to go do it more It just often. makes us want to. So you're thinking, oh, the only, and that's when we hear Jeff what? I only need to see more what? I just need to see more people. Because if I just <laughs> no. could see more people, yeah, if you need to, that's right, that's right, see more people. But no, Jeff, what do they need to do? They need to close. You better. need to close the people you're in front of, right? <laughs> so that's that's perfect. Jeff. Thanks for jumping in. Um, so then, do we accentuate? What do we accentuate, guys, when we present? The, how how we can make their lives better? Do we accentuate how we can make their lives better? Is that what we accentuate? When we're presenting, showing them our product, when we're giving them our solution, are we showing them how much better our solution is? Hey, look at this, man. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be awesome. We're gonna, we can get great rates of return. Is that what we're showing them? Come on, guys. I need somebody to... Ah, oh, thank you, Bob. Okay, we're getting some... Okay, good. No, we don't. We show, accentuate what? The bad things, Brad. Right, the negative. We accentuate the negative. And when we accentuate... The, I, see, I go through what? I go through... Rates of return and say, hey, our rates of return are going to suck. Hey, our liquidity, it's not liquid. Hey, you know what? I don't know if now is the right time. Hey, you know what? This thing has fees. I go through. Why do I go through all the negative things? My whole presentation is about the negatives. Why do I do that? Why do I prepare them for the worst? Because if they love the worst, they're okay with the worst, what do I know about the best? See, so I brought on 181 clients the last two years I was in practice. No chargebacks, no fees. Guys, how many people do you think in the industry could say they brought on 181 clients with no chargeback and no free looks? I would venture to guess me. <laughs> so what I want to do today is show you the one-way presentation and how we do that and why we do that. Now, as I'm doing this, and so Jeff, maybe you can comment on this because you listen to some, uh, some of these. And, uh, so I've got questions and statements up here. So when they say I need to think about it, Jeff, what's another thing that could have happened besides uh, showing them how great it was? Well, you know, a lot of times what I think it is is we told them, we told them what it is that we're proposing or we're presenting. So we do all the telling. And so then what they're really saying, if I were to complete their thought, they would say, I need to think about what you just told me to see if it really makes sense after I've had a chance to kind of let it digest. So you, you did all what the telling. Did, did it make sense? Did, did what the advisor oh, yeah, uh, tell sense. them make sense? Yeah. It made sense. 
but they still need to figure out if it really works the way you're saying it works. What you'd rather do is, is get them to think about it right there in front of you. Then they wouldn't have to go home to think about it because they would have already thought about it. But for them to get, for them to think about it in front of you, they're going to have to do the talking. That's right. Because if, if you do all the talking, you know what? What you're saying made sense. Unfortunately, the thing they bought, guess what? Did that make sense to them when their guy showed it to them? Oh, what they absolutely. bought, did that make sense to them when they when the guy showed it to them? The thing they're in right now. It, yes, it did. So that they can, hmm, the thing my guy showed me, that made sense. Now, the thing that this guy showed me, that makes sense. And what did Jeff, Jeff just tell you about people, uh, you know, based on that TED, TED Talks and all the research, if they got two things that make sense, yes, that's right, Jim, they're just going to what? That's a, that's a complicated decision. Both of these things made sense to them, so guess what they're going to do? Since I don't know what to do, the only thing I can do is stay where I'm at. So as we're listening to this presentation, count how many statements I make. So, so we've got about 25 after. So I'm going to start going into the actual presentation. T t tell me how many statements I make. So somebody keep score for me. I'm going to ask you at the end of the hour. Keep score. How many statements do I make versus how many questions do I ask? And as Jeff was just alluding to, that if, if, they, if all I do is ask questions, and they answer those questions, they're going to be constantly selling themselves on why they need to make the move. I don't, I don't tell them why they need to make the move. They spend an hour telling themselves why they need to make the move. So if they spend an hour explaining to themselves why they need to make the move, what do they do at the end? Would anybody say, after they spend an hour explaining to you what they're going to do, at the end of the hour say, but I'm going to think about it? They spent an hour telling you what they were going to do, at the end of the hour say, but now I'm going to think about it. It's impossible. They would never say that. Now, spend an hour telling them what they should do. Yeah, then they could say, I need to think about it. But if you have them explain to you why they need to move, they'll, ne they'll, they'll never say, I need to think about it. See, we need to change their belief. We need to, open the, we need to walk, have them walk through a door to a new reality. And what's that reality? See, if all I do is sell them, if I sell them, what can happen as soon as they go home? If I sell them, what can happen when they go home? They can be unsold, John. You hit it on the head. They can be unsold. But if I change their belief, if instead they, they explain to themselves why this, even though it doesn't give them the highest rate of return, it's what they, the return they want. Even though it doesn't give them perfect liquidity, it gives them the liquidity they want. Even if they, uh, I don't, uh, right now, even though the market's up or down, it's I need to move now. Even though this thing has fees, I need to. I, I don't care. If they explain these things to themselves, what do they now believe? What do they believe? Time to move. Yeah, I'd agree with that. See, what else? They, they need it, right, Bert? That this is better, right? So they need this product. That's what they believe. They need this product. And here's the beauty of that. Now when they go home and somebody tries to unsell them, what happens? They believe this thing fits them perfect. This is the best thing since sliced bread. They believe it. Yeah, what are they going to do? Going to dig in their heels and tell their brother-in-law to what? That he's an idiot. That this is more liquid than, than what he's in. So they have no objection. So what we're going to talk about right now, we're going to go through rate of return. Because of if, <laughs> am I going to tell them that FIA has a higher rate of return than everything? Hmm. But I'm going to t let them know what to expect, and they're going to tell me whether they like it or not. We're going to tell them liquidity, not the liquid. So we're going to go through all these things with them. At the end, we're going to have them say what? It's more liquid than money management. And fixed index. Oh, I'm going to go back. Sorry, I'm going to jump into the presentation now. So, so here we're going to. So I want you guys to count how many statements I make versus how many. Um, uh, uh, question, uh, questions I ask. So start making little hash marks. Make two columns, and uh, let's start uh, counting these things. Sure. Have things been changing a lot over the last, I don't know, five or ten years? I mean, uh, um, the political situation, has that changed pretty regularly? Yeah. Interest, yeah. interest rates? Yeah. Stock market? 
Yep. Taxes, whatever they're doing in, in Washington, it seems like things are always what? Well, they're always changing. And does it seem like they're changing faster or slower than they used to? Faster. Yeah. And with those changes, I mean, should we be proactive or should we be reactive? So should we be proactive with those changes so we try to take advantage of those changes or make sure that those changes can't hurt us? Or should we be reactive so when some change occurs, we run around or chasing our tails or trying to put out fires? Which one is better, being proactive or reactive? Being proactive is better. Yeah, being proactive is better, right? And, and you know, and with all the industries that are out there, you know, over the last uh, five or ten years, I'm going to jump forward a little bit here because this is the preempt. I think Jerry talked about this uh, with you guys on Friday about how you can enter in this conversation with a current client without them feeling like you're selling them anything. So how did Jerry do last Friday, guys? Do you get that on how you should you ever feel bad about presenting a new product to? Uh, yeah, he did great, didn't he? So I'm going to jump forward. I think it's like two minutes ahead here where we actually get into the presentation. With all the new changes, techniques, I will forget about it. I will forget about it. So, yeah, you'd think, but actually over the last 10 years, it's been closer to about another big oh, question. Sorry, we're 10 we're years, what do you see with all the new changes, techniques, and solutions available out there? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Or should I say, ah, we'll forget about it. We'll just keep doing things the way, always did, the way we always did. No, if there's a way we can do better, we want to do yeah. better. Yeah, it only makes sense, right? Right. Right. So what I want to do today is just kind of show you the new things that are out there. Now, okay, so now we're into the one-way presentation. But even up to this point, how many statements have I made, guys? You guys know how many statements did I make? Zero. Please, I'm going to play that again. Those of you that are saying I made three statements, please show me where I made the statements. So tell me where I make a statement. The stock market. Yep. Taxes. Oh, John, okay, John. John said, yeah, right. And my counting got. So you're right, John. So I stand corrected. So John's saying I made two statements, but I, my, my statements were what? I'm not, when I'm getting on somebody's side, am I going to ask them another question when I'm getting on somebody's side? So touche, John, you're right. You got me. But, I'm, but got is not a statement. Got is what? Got is got. So I stand corrected, John, so you, get, you got me. I, I do make statements when I get on their side. But how many points, let me ask you that then. How many points did I make? Did I make any points? Because any point worth making must be made by who? Them. So have I made any points yet? No, I haven't made a single one. They're making up. So, John, you got me. Yes, when I'm doing got, I do say statements, but we're not, uh, we're not including that. So I'm going to get, get to right here. We're into the actual presentation. We'll forget about it. We'll just keep doing things the way, always did, the way we always did. No, if there's a way we can do better, we want to do yeah. better. Yeah, it only makes sense, right? Right. Right. So what I want to do today is just kind of show you the new things that are out there. Now, all your money is invested, so you might not be able to use that now. But it's Why do I say that, guys? During this presentation, I'm constantly saying, now, all your money is invested, you might not be able to use this right now. Why am I saying that? I'm not saying that. Why am I asking that question? <laughs> Why am I asking that question? Take away to disarm them. You're not selling. You're just saying, hey, we're just talking about a concept here. So that's right. So, and do I say that once or do I say that many times during the presentation? Actually, after every, you're right, many times, because after every topic, I'll say, yeah, this is, you know, I'll ask them, so what do all my clients, all my clients that have new money, what do they want to do? Oh, they'd want to do this. Now, of course, you get your, your money's all locked up, so you may not be able to do this, but whatever, everybody else that has free money, what do they want to do? They want to do this thing. I keep having them tell me everybody wants to do this thing, but, but I take it off the table, but hey, let's not worry about what you're going to do, because your money's already, already invested. We don't need to worry about what, do you get why I'm doing that? There we go. It pays to kind of stay on top of things, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, you know, over the last... Um, 10 years, what do you think the market, stock market is averaged? Mm, maybe like 10% or so? Yeah, you'd think, but actually over the last 10 years, it's been closer to about 6 or 7. Did I do something wrong there, guys? Yes, John, what did I do wrong, John? Oh, no, I asked the question, so that wasn't what I got wrong. What did I do wrong? 
Oh, no, you're right, John. I did ask. No, I, I made a statement, John. And that, I got double wrong, right? Because I made a statement, and I what? Corrected him. Bert got it. I corrected Yeah, everybody's getting it. I corrected him. So what I should have said, said, yeah, that's, you know what? 10%. That's what I thought, because, you know, what we're always told by everybody is 10%. I mean, anytime you ask somebody, what's the market? They 10%. You look in a magazine article, 10%. When you go to, you know, when you, when you read a book or you talk to an expert, 10% is what they say. And you know what? A lot of times it is 10%. But every 10 years is different, and it, even though it's 10% most often, guess what we found when we go, went back and looked at the last 10 years? Even though most often it's 10%, guess what we found over the last 10 years? That would have been far better. So, again, every, I've been doing this for 17 years, and, and I make mistakes. So what's the value of listening to tapes, guys? <laughs> the tapes don't lie. <laughs> Because there, there's a point right there. I could have done uh, much better than what I did there, seven percent. But okay. you, but you hit it right on the head. Guess what the rate of return has been over the last hundred years on average? Yeah, probably right around ten percent. Right around ten percent. Right around ten percent. And then, uh, like, but how about like during certain time periods, like from two thousand to two thousand ten, where we had a big crash in two thousand, another big crash in two thousand seven. What did the market average during that ten year time period? I'm sure it was a lot worse. Um, Four or five, maybe? Actually, it was 0%. Okay. So, what did I do wrong? He answered wrong. What did I not do? What should I have done? You're right, John. Yep. What I should. What do we do when somebody answers the wrong thing? We what? Fall on the sword. Fall on the sword. So, I should have said, I either asked the wrong question, or I should have said, that's what I thought. I mean, but, but uh, so again, You've got to be really careful uh, about about um, when they say something wrong, not moving along because you have an agenda, but instead falling on the sword first and then uh, having them discover for themselves what that is. Well, you know, depending on which period we're talking about, it could be market could get, do what? Six, seven, could be 10, could be zero, could be negative. Sure. We're going to look, overlook a short period of time, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, so the reason I bring that up is if, if I were to give you two a choice of two different investments, one is an 8% rate of return, and one has a 10% rate of return. Which one would you choose? I'd take the 10. I'd take the 10, too. I mean, why would you take the 10? Oh, well, because it's a better rate. Do you notice, is this something that we do constantly, like with the, the power of attorney with 100 versus 50? Do you notice that we, why do I do this? Why do I always lay it out there and give them, you know, set it up so that they would want the thing that people would normally want first? Why do I always lay it out there? That's right, Jim, the eye doctor. Go here side by side. What else? What's the other reason? Because anybody that would walk, it's logical, right, John? It's logical. Anybody walking in off the street that was given an 8% versus a 10% rate of return, what, they, what would they say? 10, 10, 10. Everybody would say 10. So what I try to do is make sure I'm not like, I'm, or, you know, that I'm at least balancing the recommendations. So I'm not coming in there saying, hey, 8 better than 10, 8 better than 10, 8 better than 10. What am I saying? With no further information, 10 is always going to be a bigger is better when it comes to rates of return. Bigger is better, but I have to have them discover for themselves that bigger is better or bigger is not always better. See, they have to come to that conclusion themselves. So first of all, I have to say it's okay. I mean, logically, 10 is better so that, that later on they can say, logically, 8 is better. Do you, know, do you see that? I'm always going to give them the logical first before I have them walk away from the logical to the more reasonable um, uh, recommendation that we're, we're asking them. Does that make sense? We use that continually through the system, constantly, constantly. Your return. Duh, right? If I asked 100 people out there, hey, would you rather have 8 or would you rather have 10, what would they all say? I'd say 10. 10, duh. But let's put a little fly in the ointment. What if with the 10% uh, rate of return, the next year, you could uh, make another 10 or 20%, or the next year, you could actually lose your 10% and lose another 10 or 20%. But with the 8, once you got it, they can never take that away. It can either go up or go sideways. Which one would you rather, which one would you rather get? In that case, I'd probably take the 8. The 8. You know, and I've asked 100 people that in the last few months, and guess what they all said, too? The 8. Okay, so he said, he used a word I do not like. What word was that? See if anybody caught that. 
What word did Jeff use that I do not like? Well, you're close, Bill. He didn't use that number, but it was the same thing. Probably, Matt. You got it. He said probably. Maybe he did say a guess, but I know he said probably. So when they says guess or probably, that's a qualifying language. So I could have stopped right there, but my next question was, if I lined up 100 people and asked them whether they'd rather have the 8 or 10 with those conditions, what would everybody say? And then did he just, did he just say, did he say probably 8, or did he say they'd all say 8? He said they'd all say 8. So guess what? He, I, I've taken them from qualifying language to what? 8 is a fact, or, or 8 may or may not be the right answer. He says every, out of 100, everybody, yeah, it's fact. We've turned it to fact. So if he had said probably again, then I, if he used qualifying language two sentences in a row when I'm trying to lock him down, what is he telling me? He's not tracking. He's not agreeing. I'm going to have to circle back. Do I keep moving on then, or am I going to have to circle back and get his agreement on that? Uh, without any uh, qualifications, without any reservations, get his agreement. If he, if he did not, yeah, I have to circle back. Yay, but I'm confused, because isn't 10 bigger than 8? Yeah, but the 8's guaranteed. The 10, you don't know what's going to happen. Ah, uh, the 8 is guaranteed. The 10, you don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, when it comes to uh, our money, especially as we get closer to retirement or actually retired, the one thing we never want to do is make a what in retirement? Oh, we don't want to make any mistakes. We don't want to make a mistake. So which one of those is mistake-free or mistake-proof? The 8%. The 8% is mistake proof. And is that what all of us want when it comes to our money? Yeah, definitely. So 10% is better, but it could also be what? Could be worse. Worse. So we want the one that's always good and can never be what? Can never be bad. Can never be bad. How many times have I made him say in the last 30 seconds that he wants something mistake proof? Three or four. In 30 seconds, three or four times. So, and is Jeff getting mad at me for having him say that three or four times? And why do I want, no, he's not. So why do I want him to say it three or four times? What, I, what am I imprinting on his brain? That he wants the highest rate of return possible, or he wants to make sure above all other things that he does not want to what? That's right, but I want him to own it. What, that he owns it that what? Does not want to make a what? Mistake exactly, Jim. So, so far, uh, we're what, uh, five minutes into this, how many statements, except for that one, not talking about gots, but I've made two statements, both of them were bad, right? Because twice I corrected him. So the only time I'm making statements is when I'm correcting him. So in other words, if I'm doing it right, how many, how many, uh, 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 all the points I'm making, though, am I making, have I made a single point here, except when I said twice I corrected him? Am I making any other points, or is he making all the points? Okay, so we've had a question, guys. And let's see if some of the veterans, if we can answer this. So I have a guy saying, hey, what if they say this? What do I say, say to any questions where the, the advisor says, hey, what if they say this? What do I say? Well, we, obviously, the veterans have forgotten my, my scorching uh, guys. If you do it the way I ask you to do it, will they say this? No, because who's making all the points here? They are. If I make the points, they will say that. So it drives me bananas when somebody says, well, what if they say this? Well, Jeff Freeberg, how often when they do it the way we ask them to do it, do people say things, any other, anything else except what we ask, say that the client's going to say? Well, never. And you can even kind of go back and, and check that for yourself if you don't believe that, because that's kind of a bold statement. They never. Um, go back and listen to this and see how many times would you have answered different than I did. And I'm sure you'll say, yeah, I guess none. Because we do something attorneys can't do. We ask leading questions. I don't ask a question unless I know there's only one answer to it, guys. So if they say something like that, then what do you do? You screwed up. You go back and you learn a what? Better. 
Yes, you learn the script. So sorry for getting a little irritated there, but that's the question that drives the – guys, we've been doing this for 17 years. Do you really think if somebody was saying that, that we wouldn't have fixed it? So, Jeff, you and I have a conversation every Monday and say, yeah, you know, they, people keep saying, yeah, but this is an annuity. I wish we could fix that. For, for the last 17 years, we've had that conversation, right? <laughs> no, wish we could figure out what to say. Well, and that's the benefit of you guys all doing the same system. We know what people – it isn't just that what, what are we saying when we're role-playing. We know what everybody in the meetings are saying because we hear them every week. So we know what's going on. If that was a problem, we would address it. So as soon as that happens, send me the tape. Uh, Jeff will run in, Missy will run in, give me smelling salts, you know, and then I'll call you up and guess what we'll do after that point. We'll fix it. And so that, that's, that's kind of what I want to show you, some of the changes that have occurred uh, here very, very recently, is they now have um, some new types of uh, things that people can in, 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 use to put their money in, which they call hybrids. Now, when, when I say hybrid, what does that bring to your mind? That's a good demonstration there. It seems like I was making a statement but I was instead making a statement in order to set up the what? So sometimes I do a lot of yakking, but the yakking is simply me giving you information to ask the question. Oh, and I, Dave, don't worry about it, but that's, we need somebody every six months or so to bring, Dave, Dave's apologizing for, for asking that question, previous question. Uh, we need somebody every six months for me to, to make that point, so don't worry about it. So, uh, so the, the 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 when I'm yakking though, I am generally just yakking to set up the question to ask that leading question. Framing it, Jim, exactly framing it. Oh, that it's a kind of a mix of different things. Yeah, it's a mix of different things. So, so when they mix things up, you know, when they've combined things, because isn't that what they do with the hybrids? They mix combine a couple of things, whether it's plants or cars or or whatever. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And do you think when they're combining things, do you think they're combining the worst characteristics of each thing or the best characteristics no. of each thing? It's the best. So why am I going to have Jeff describe to me why a hybrid is terrific? Why am I having going to have Jeff sell himself? He's selling himself, but selling himself on what? What's he selling himself on? The comfort, of, I love that, Robert, the comfort of a hybrid. Why, the concept, Brad, that's what, it, yes, the, the concept. See, is there anything on the table right now? Are we talking about products right now? No, so it's very easy for Jeff to say, hey, this concept is what already? We're five minutes in, and Jeff's going to tell me this concept is terrific because there's nothing on the table. Do you, do you see that, do we do that uh, other places in the 5Q system too? where we get them to buy into the concept before we get down to the nitty gritty. For example, with the beneficiaries, do we say, hey, if we have a pie, if we have anything, we cut it into three pieces, how many, how many pieces do they get? Three. Yeah, if we had a pie, how many pieces do they get? Well, three. So if we had a count, how many pieces does each person get? Uh, uh, 30, 30%. So, you know, we, we, um, we, con we constantly go from, from big picture to little picture, because if they agree the in the big picture things work this way, They'll agree in the medium picture is going to work this way, and then when it comes down to them, it works this way. Does that make sense? So I'm getting Jeff to tell me the concept of a hybrid is terrific, because there's, and he's able to give me that without any fear, because there's nothing on the table yet. Does that make sense, or am I speaking Greek? Does that make sense? I get a few amens? Okay, good. I get a few yeses. Good. That's the two things. It's the best of two things. So what I want to do is show you kind of how this hybrid, uh, th these new hybrids have come up with, with work. So we said that if the market goes up 10%, uh, it goes up 8%, the 10 is better, right? Yep. But we'd probably still choose the what if we had that fly in the ointment? Uh, we'd choose the 8. Yeah, and, wh and why would we choose the 8? Well, because it's guaranteed and can't go down. Right. So how many, se even when I made those mistakes, guys, and made the statements of correcting Jeff, which was wrong, but even when I did that, how many seconds goes by before another question pops out of my mouth? What's the most that would go by before? Five seconds is about right, Jim. Never longer than 10. Never longer than 10. So, and why? Why am I, why am I asking a question every five to 10 seconds, if not shorter? Ah, keep them engaged. 
Because here's the thing: if I if I talk, keep their attention, right, Bob? Because what's we, we just talked about this about three or four weeks ago. What are people's attention spans today? High or low? You have about seven seconds, right? So I need to keep them engaged. The only way I know them that they're going to get engaged and not start to wander is if I'm constantly asking those questions. And do you notice so far, have I asked any, as Jeff was saying, do I ask any question that the, the, the answer isn't already right before them? Because the 10 might do what? Go down. Right. So, let, so uh, let's say it went down, I don't know, 30%. Has, has the market gone down? So there, I made a statement. The 10 might do what? Might go down. And then I quickly, though, answered or asked a quick other question. So that's only, that's less than five seconds before I asked the next question. Even though I made a statement in there, I quickly asked the question right after that, all within a five-second period. 30% in, uh, in the recent history? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, it did it in 2000. It did it. Okay, here's a good question. So I said, has the market gone down 30% in recent his his history? What did the market actually go down in 2000 and 2007, guys? How much did the market go down? Yeah, 50, John. So why am I saying 30 when it went down 50 both times? Why am I saying 30 if it went down 50 both times? That's more believable, John. Do I want to get into an argument about whether it's going to go down 50 like the next time? No. So I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. I'll say it'll go down about half as much as it went down before. So we don't get into an argument about something that doesn't need to be argued about. Make sense? A lot, do, you, do you see me use that consistently through the uh, 5Q system, too, where if something's bad, I'm going to say, well, let's say it's not quite as bad. Let's say it's only half as bad, but could you live with that? And, and <laughs> even when it's half as bad, they're going to say, no. Again, when? Uh, 2008. Yeah, 2008. So, but with the 8, we said once you've earned that 8, they can, you never what? Uh, you can't, you can't, you never lose it. It's yours to keep. You never lose it. That's right. So now, which one would you rather be in then? Who looks smarter? The person who had the eight. <laughs> the person who had the eight. Now, on the next year, uh, what can the market do? It can do two things. It can go what or what? could go up or down. could go up or down. But in this particular case, instead of going down, let's say it went down 30%, so it started to come back up again. Now, okay. in order to get back to ground zero, when you lose 30%, how much do you have to go to get back to ground zero or make all your money back. And here's, here's a way to think about it. If I have $100 and I lose $50, uh, $50, I'm down how much? What percentage? You're down to, well, you're down 50%. Down 50%. So I started with 100 and I'm down to 50. Now, I lost 50%. Now I want to grow that back to 100. How much do I have to go to get back to 100? From 50 to, to 100. It. I have to double it. Yep. So why do I go through this? this conversation first about 100, I mean going down 50, what percentage are we down and then if I go from 50 to go back to 100, how much do I have to go up? Why don't I have that conversation before I talk about the 30% and then it has to go up 43 to get back to, to, to ground even? Just talked about it here a few minutes ago. If I told them, sure, if I had them just, uh, how many people would guess if I said, hey, if the market goes down 30%, it has to go up to 43% to get back to ground even? How many people would get to know that? Zero, exactly. If I told them that, how many would believe me then? Or how many, and, or would some people still be thinking, I don't think that's the way it works. If it goes down 30, it has to go up 30 to get back around. Would some people still think that that was the way, it, uh, would they believe me <laughs> that it, when it goes down 30, it has to go up 43%? There's just still be some people thinking that. So I'm going to walk them through 100 versus 50. How many people will get the market fall, go, if the, something drops from 100 down to 50, you lose 50%. How many people will get that answer? And if I say, if I have 50, what does that have to do to get back to 100? How many people will get that? With a little coaching, maybe. Yeah, because if 50 has to what? To go up to 100. That's what? Double. So double is what? I mean, something went up how much? See, I'm going to coach them through that. Can they get that? Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. And that's a good example of, you know, whoever asked the question, what if they say, because that was happening. Some, if the market went down 30, how much would it have to go back to get to ground even? Sometimes they were saying 30. Well, when we heard that, we fixed it and jumped in with this, this fix. So you really don't have to worry about what happens if. We've, with, like I said, listening to literally thousands over the years, but still dozens a week, 
I know what yeah. people are saying. Exactly. And that, so that's how we, we set it up. So we say in big picture, if it works that way with 150, it's also going to work that way with 30. So that's, that's what we're doing there. And when you double it, that means it has to go up 100%, doesn't it? Right. Right. So that's not really fair. I only lost 50%, but I have to do what to get back to ground? What did I do wrong there? That's a closed-ended question. So it has to, if it goes to 50, it has to get it double to get back to 100, didn't it? And, and Jeff said right. Do I know whether he got that or not when he says right? What does right mean or yes mean? Nothing. So I, sh I should have coached him through. She said, so we go from 50 to 100, how much is that? I, that's the proper way to do that. So even if, again, guys, I could listen to my taste all day long. Here's why you need to listen to your taste. I can listen to my, uh, can we agree, I'm probably better than you guys. And I could still listen to my tapes all day long and find things I could have done better. It's just that when I do, what I do is what? I do it right more often than wrong. That's what you want to be looking for because nobody's going to do this perfect. You just want to be do it right more often than wrong. Zero. You have to make 100. That's not fair, is it? <laughs> no. But that's the way it works. So here's the thing. If you, if you go down 30, how much do you have to go to get back to, to your original amount again? Uh, probably 60. And that's what I would guess. When somebody first asked me that, that's what I get. I set that up. I wanted him to say 60. Why? Why did I want him to say 60? If it went down 30, it has to go back up 60 to get back around even again. Because, again, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. Like we just talked about earlier with that, we're giving them the benefit of the doubt. We're saying that, hey, it doesn't even have to go up 60. It can go up just 43%. So that we're, we're so we're giving him the so he's saying oh wow if I said well really it'd have to go up even 150 percent see they're not going to believe it. instead when they say 60 I say well actually it only has to come up 43 percent it's giving them the benefit of the doubt I'm moving it down from what he thought not making it worse than what he thought I'm making it better than what he thought he's still going to find out that that is good or bad even though it wasn't as bad as he thought it's still what bad enough. Actually, math is kind of funny. It ends up you have to go up 43%, but that's still more than 30%, right? So you only lost right. 30%, but you have to go up even more to what? To get back to where you started. Which isn't fair, but that's the way the, the math works. So let's say the market starts to climb back up, because it could go down, but we're going to say it doesn't do that. Let's say it starts to go back up. So let's say, I don't know, it goes up uh, uh, 20%. And then so if uh, this one only if this one goes up uh, uh, 20%, how much is this one going to go up? The eight. Eight. It goes up eight. And then this goes up another ten. And this goes up what? Eight. Eight. And this goes up another ten. And this goes up what? Uh, eight. Eight. And then we're at twenty, thirty, forty. We have to go up how much more to get to forty-three? Uh, another three. Three. And then this goes up another three. Because I don't know if I told you this, but the hybrid. So. Why do I break that into pieces, 20, 10, 10, and 3? Why do I break that into pieces? That's right. It's easier to digest. It makes it more reasonable. It helps them uh, uh, believable, exactly. And it's breaking into tiny little pieces that makes it also more understandable. Make sense? So if, if, it goes, if, if the market makes 10, it's capped at 8. But if the market only makes five, it makes five. If the market makes three, it makes what? Makes three. Three. So it's, it's only, it, it'll make whatever the market does until. So uh, we're running, running late here, but I didn't want to show you the whole video. What, I want, what do you think I want you to understand about this presentation? What do you think I want you to understand about this presentation? Yeah, questions. That's hit, you hit it right on the head, John. Questions, no statements. And if I do make up a statement, how quickly, how many seconds before I ask a state, uh, question? If I do make a statement, how many, many seconds should uh, uh, perspire before I make, ask another question? Two or three or five, exactly. So why does that work then? See, I'm not going to tell them the rate of return is not, that they should love an 8% instead of a 10% rate of return, or they should love a 50% rate of return instead of all the return. Who's going to tell me that? Who's going to tell me that 50% of the return is better than 100%, or that 8 is better than 10%? 
And how many times are they going to tell me that? Once. Over and over and over and over and over. You know, and then let me ask you, what's more liquid, money management or fixed index annuities? What's more liquid? Because fixed index annuities have what? Seven year surrenders. Right? So I got a couple of guys sucked in that said money management. I got lots of guys telling me the right thing. 10% is jack squat. 10% is not more liquid. That means 90% of your money is what? Ninety percent of your money is what? If ten percent is liquid, ninety percent is what? Locked up. But you guys that think that money market is more liquid than fixed index annuities are in la la land. Put me in front of your clients, and guess what's going to happen to your money management account? It's going to go bye bye. Put anybody that knows this presentation in front of your money management clients, and guess what's going to happen to your clients? They're going to go bye bye. So I'm not going to actually go through the presentation, but I'll give you the high notes of how they decide that fixed index annuities are more liquid than money management. Hey, if the market falls 30%, well, first of all, if they need money, how many people pull out 100% of their money out of annuities? Over the last 30 years, how many people have pulled 100% of their money out of annuities? No one does, right. So instead, they do what? They pull out pieces. So what I do is I never bring up 10% withdrawal. I never bring that up. I say, hey, here's what can happen. You can pull out, and I'll give them the number, whatever the 10% is. I'll say, you can pull out this amount. Will that buy you a, a roof? Will that buy you a vacation? Will that buy you this? Will that buy you that? Will this? I go through the whole laundry list of things that that will buy. And guess what they say? Yeah, it'll give me all those things. They said, now, do, do we want to pull out more than that and pay all the taxes and run out of money early? And what do they say to that? No, I don't want to do that. And I say, well, what if we need double that? Don't, doesn't life throw us curveballs? What if we need to double the, the 10%? What if we needed, again, I don't say 10%. Let's just say they had 300,000 in there. Say, what if they needed 60 instead of 30? I mean, would, 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 that could happen, couldn't it? Could, couldn't it be one year we need a car and the, roof, uh, the water heater goes out and the roof needs to be redone? Couldn't that happen? I mean, if it happened every year, we'd run out of money how soon? Yeah, but could it happen any particular year? Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. And then what I do is I show them. That, that if they pull it out, they're going to get a penalty on the second 30000 And I call it an early withdrawal penalty. And then what I, we walk through is what? We say, hey, we apply that penalty against the whole 300000 because we agreed that people will or will not pull out the whole amount, 100% of their money. Well, not. So I'm going to apply the penalty against the whole 300000 so it ends up being about 1.5%. So I ask them, how quickly can you lose 1.5% in the market? What do they say? How quickly can you lose 1.5% in the market? Yeah, quickly. So, and if you don't be thinking, so can you, can you live with a 1.5% penalty if you need to pull out more money earlier? And what do they all say to this? What do they all say? Yeah. Have I mentioned the 10% withdrawal? No, guys. So learn to do it our way. Then I'll go through and say, now if the market did fall, has the market, we said earlier, the market can fall 30%, 40%, 50%, can it do that? And they say, yeah. Now if we need to pull out money, which one's more liquid? Oh, the fixed index annuity. By a little or a lot. Because the worst case scenario, we're going to get hit with a 1.5% on the fixed index annuity. But if the market's down 50%, what are we going to get hit on that uh, with that uh, withdrawal? What's the penalty on that, guys? If the market's down 30% or 50%, what's the, penalty, what's the uh, early withdrawal penalty on money management? 50%, right. You don't even get the 10% free. You get hit with the 30 or 50% on all of your money that you withdraw. So now which one's more liquid, FIA or money management? And then I walk through uh, uh, products, whether they are just a fixed index annuity or they're the, um, the, the life hybrid, and I talk about, hey, and uh, money back guarantees. Money back guarantees, good or bad thing? What does that say about the people who are offering it? Well, guess what? Fixed index annuities and the hybrid life and long-term care, they have money back guarantees. Does your money manager have a, a, a money back guarantee? You put the money in, two weeks later, the market's down 30%. Can you say, hey, 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 I'd like my money back. Just give me my money back. What would the money manager say? Ha, ha, ha. What will your fixed index annuity say? What will your li hybrid life say? They'll give it back to you. That's a guarantee. They, they, guarantee, they back their product. Then I go through, hey, you know what? Fixed index annuities and these other life long term, they, they know that you could go, because when's the, when's the time you're going to need to pull out all your money, guys? What's the time you're going to, when will you pull out all your money? 
When do you need to pull out all your money? What things? Health, long-term care. Right, Brad, long-term care. You know what? And these FIAs and these, <laughs> these um, uh, life hybrids, guess what? They'll allow you to pull out big chunks of it. But when you go to your money manager and you and ask them, hey, I need some money out of there, what's he going to say? Sure, but will they give you a kicker for that? Heck, a lot of annuities and the life uh, hybrids will give you even more than you need for long-term care, but what you have deposited for long-term care. And then, I, then I, so they, they're going to tell me over and over and over that fixed index annuities are more liquid than money managers. They're going to tell me over and over and over it's more liquid than money managers. And it is. Now, here's the thing. If I can prove to them, I'm sorry, if they can prove to me that, that fixed index annuities are more liquid than money managers, guess what it's easy to have them say? Because money management should be as liquid as they come. So if I can have them tell me fixed index annuities are more liquid than money managers, <laughs> they're also, it's very easy to get them to say it's more liquid than other VAs, it's, it's more li uh, liquid than mutual funds, it's more liquid, I mean, virtually than any other thing. Because I can get them to tell me it's not a little more liquid than money management, it's way more liquid. Because the last thing I'll ask them is, so let's say that you have, <laughs> you know, uh, the things happen, bad things happen in groups or, or by themselves, in groups. Yeah, so let's say, you know, I open up the envelope, I see the market's down 30%, I have a heart attack, now what? I'm in a long-term care facility, the market's down 30%, what's going to happen to my money? So in really bad times, which one's more liquid, money management or fixed index annuities? By a little or by a lot? So guess what? I ask that by a little or a lot. They're going to tell me that fixed index, fixed index annuities are a lot more liquid than money management a lot more liquid than VAs, a lot more liquid than uh, mutual funds, at least six, seven times. So if they told me that, that, that these things are more liquid than money management, fixed in, or uh, the VAs, um, uh, mutual funds, six, seven times, then what do they believe? Now what if I sold them, what do they believe? If they told me six, seven times that these kind of annuities are more liquid not only by a little, but by a lot than money management, what do they believe? That it's true. So I got two people to agree on that, and yeah, that they are. So when they go home and their brother-in-law says, you know, you're locking your money up, what are they going to tell their brother-in-law? You're an idiot. These things are the liquid, most liquid things they're out there. So am I saying that they're liquid or am I having them uh, figure out, you know what, on everything that life can throw me in life, this thing is more liquid than money managers. This thing is more liquid than VAs. This thing is more liquid than mutual funds. And I don't tell them that. They tell me. And I never use 10%. So why do you need to learn to do this the way that we show you how to do it? Because if you do it the way we show you how to do it, they're going to tell you that, hey, this gives me the rate of return that I want. This gives me the liquidity I want. This gives me. This is the right time to do it. There, there's uh, uh, this, this. I don't mind paying these fees. This is way better than my current investment. And they say that over and over and over and over and over. So by the end of an hour, Jeff, how many people would say I need to think about it? None. I mean, they've all, they've thought about it. There's nothing more to think about. They've, and that's the key, guys. Get them to think about it out loud right there in front of you, and you won't get that anymore. So does this make sense, guys? Do you see now why Jerry invests the time in you to help you learn these three presentations? We have a, why do we have a 100% closing ratio with these presentations when they're done right? Why do we have 100%? Guys, how many other presentations out there have a 100% closing ratio? And why can I say that this has a 100% closing ratio? Because if they spend an hour and they tell you at least 200 times that this is way better than what they currently have, they're gonna, they tell you 200 times that this is way better than what they currently have, what wacko is going to say, but I think I'll stay with where I'm at. If they say it once, that's nothing. 200 times what wacko will stay where they're at then? Nobody. So. Besides the 21-point checklist, grab one of these selling presentations 
and learn it backwards and forwards. And how many seconds should go by with before you ask another question with these presentations? There you go. Cool. So thanks, everybody. Hope you found this helpful. Uh, let's see. We did it. Well, obviously, there's no call next Friday. There's no call next Monday. And there's no call the next Friday. So we're going to have three. Uh, we're going to have a holiday break here. And then we'll start up at the beginning of the new year. So I wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas and uh, happy holidays. And thank you for being on in 2015. And our goal is to make your 2016 way better than your 2015 was. Thanks, everybody. Take care.